And welcome to Geneva History and Mixology with Philip Duff. That's me. If you don't know who I am, well, my name's Philip Duff. I'm an Irishman who bartended from the age of 15, and that's probably how I wound up in Holland for 17 years, learning the language, working in the bars, opening a bar, and falling in love with Geneva, which is where we come to this webinar, seminar, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Uh, if you like what you hear and see, follow me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on Instagram. It's Philip S for Stephen, D-U-F-F. That's Philip S for Stephen, D-U-F-F. If you like Fine Geneva, give a follow to Old Duff Geneva, my brand, Old, O-L-D, Duff, D-U-F-F, Geneva, G-E-N-E-V-E-R. All right, let's get into this. There is a massive elephant in the room to address before you ever teach anything about Geneva at all, and that elephant is named Gin. Everyone thinks that Gin is like Geneva, and everybody is absolutely fucking wrong. I like to use a simple analogy. Geneva is like Conrad Hilton. It created something that bestrode the entire world like a colossus. It was the most drunk export spirit, etc., etc., etc. Respected, feared even, by one and all. And then there's Conrad's great-granddaughter, Paris Hilton, who is, how can we say this, famous for other things. Conrad is like Geneva. Paris is a bit more like gin. And hey, we all like a bit of gin now and then, don't we? Nothing wrong with it at all. They're just different. I'm going to explain how that came to be a bit later. Geneva, as we know it, became Geneva somewhere around 1582, because that is when Caspar Janzoon Kolhase wrote a book called A Guide to Distilling in Holland. Now, priests are not what they used to be. Because that's what Casper used to be, and he was actually excommunicated for radical, arguing that the church shouldn't have that much power. And instead of setting up his own church or starting a podcast, he became a distiller. He had a distillery, at least in Leiden, maybe with his son in Amsterdam as well. And he saw distilling as almost a religious, pardon the pun, spiritual thing. So when he wrote this book, he wrote in a kind of a sneering tone of voice that Korenbrandewein, meaning grain distillate, in aroma and taste is almost the same as brandy wine, which he means grape distillate, and is not only named brandy wine, but drunk and paid for as brandy wine. That's actually my, me doing the voice of the eagle from the Muppets. What it was, he's saying that corn brandy wine, which is what Geneva used to be called before it was usually called Geneva, is overtaking grape distillate, right? And people are paying for it and enjoying it. And he wasn't having any of it. But the fact that he was writing this in 1582 meant that it already had. In the beginning, most, in like most countries, the first distillates were based on something that was very easy to ferment and distill, i.e. wine, because grapes already have the sugar in them. Easy. But in Ireland, where whiskey's from, and in Holland, where uh, Geneva is from, all the grapes were usually, usually mostly imported. And when there was a problem or a war or whatever, it became difficult to get hold of them. So in Ireland, they switched from distilling with grapes to distilling with grain. And that was the start of what became whiskey. The same thing happened in Holland. They were sick of being at war with Germany or France or Spain and not being able to get grapes. So they said, screw it, screw it, we're going over to grain. So Geneva, as we know it, a grain-based spirit with a tiny bit of uh, juniper, we can date that pretty accurately to around the late 1500s, 1582 and on. Now, we mentioned whiskey earlier, and we talked about Geneva and gin. So Geneva is the ancestor of gin, but it's a closer ancestor of whiskey. Because back in the day, all whiskey was grain-based, like Geneva, 
unaged, like Geneva, and it contained botanicals, like Geneva, small amounts, like Geneva, and very often the same botanicals. One of the first ever written recipes for the oldest type of whiskey in the world, Irish, is from a book called Platt's Delights for Ladies, uh, written in 1611. It was a sort of a guide on how to manage a stately home and an estate for, you know, aristocratic women, how to manage the staff and make sure the kitchen is going well and the stables are fine and all this kind of thing. And there's a recipe in it to make ishkaba, Irish aqua vitae, to every gallon of aqua composita, put two ounces of licorice bruised and cut into small pieces, but cleansed of its filth, and also two ounces of aniseed. And there's many other recipes using things uh, that were also used for Geneva, such as juniper. So Geneva and whiskey were pretty identical until the 1800s. Then they purposefully began to store whiskey in first sherry barrels for taste purposes. And after a little while, they began taking out the botanicals. So whiskey changed, but Geneva never did. When you drink a real Dutch Geneva, especially 100% malt wine Geneva, you're drinking exactly what somebody was having in the 14, 15, and 1600s. Now, you've probably heard Geneva referred to as Geneva. I actually have sat at many a bar and overheard the bartender explaining to people that Geneva is from Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland, and that it's named after the city in Switzerland, and it's absolutely not true. It is the fault of somebody called Philip Massinger. He wrote a play called The Duke of Milan in 1623. And it had a joke in it, and he was English, so it was a bad joke. But the essence of it was that uh, a army officer, and army officers were renowned for drinking back then, would get so drunk that uh, they couldn't read anything unless it was printed in Geneva print, a very large scale font. And the joke was, that uh, the officers were drunk on Geneva. So he's making a play on words between Geneva and Geneva. Unfortunately, this led to a lot of people calling Geneva, Geneva. There's many a picture of old Geneva bottles with Geneva on it, because the Dutch are lovely people, as are the Belgians who can also make uh, Geneva, but they're essentially a trading nation, a commercial nation. And they're like, whatever the hell you want us to put on the label is fine by us so long as you just buy the fucking bottles. So you can easily find bottles that say Geneva. You could say ones that say Geneva Gin. One of the biggest brands the world's ever seen was actually sometimes labeled Geneva, sometimes labeled gin, sometimes labeled aromatic Skidam schnapps. So long as you buy that bottle, we'll put whatever you like on the label. That was the philosophy back then. Now, it was always in ceramic bottles until around the 1600s. Those ceramic bottles, you've probably seen perhaps in Holland examples of them. There's some people still use them today. And those were general purpose bottles for everything right? Not just for Geneva. You would get a bottle like that and you might fill it up with beer. You go to the bar, they'd fill it up with beer. You could take it home, drink it, just like a modern day growler. The same was true of Geneva. You would get a bottle, drink it, then you take it back to the bar you bought it from and they would fill up the bottle for you. This was all well and good until around the 1630s when the industry switched over to glass bottles. A number of advantages to glass. One was you could create a brand. Instead of it being this generic ceramic bottle, you could put your stamp on the bottle and maybe a label and stuff, and it could be sealed. So anybody buying it knows they're getting the real stuff. Because back then, there was no trademark. There was no patent office. Anything that was successful would be immediately ripped off and copied. However, brilliantly, the introduction of glass bottles led to mass unemployment for a load of teenage boys. Believe it or not, there was an entire profession, and it was usually adolescent boys, who worked in Geneva bars, maybe uh, mopping the floors and cleaning up. And one of their duties was to be the uh, croc sniffer. 
they would have to smell every empty bottle brought back to them for refilling with Geneva because this was also a time before indoor toilets. And if you needed to have a pee or something during the night, well, you kind of grabbed whatever was close to hand. And a good Geneva bar didn't want to refill a crock that had previously been used for pee because then everyone would say, your Geneva tastes like pee. So the introduction of glass bottles is generally a good thing, but it led to a load of unemployed teenage boys. Now, the reason those bottles were the shape that they are, that kind of square tapering thing, is so that you could fit the maximum number of them in a case. The thing was, Holland was just about the world's preeminent naval nation back then, and it was doing everything from taking over the sugar plantations from the Portuguese in Brazil to pretending it hadn't discovered Australia six times because it was too busy to colonizing what is now New York. They had a finger everywhere and very often they were doing business with their colonies and indeed other colonies in parts of the world that didn't even have harbors. So you couldn't roll a big barrel down a, a gangway or anything like that. So instead, they used glass bottles packed into crates, which could be lowered off a big Dutch ship into a rowing boat and rowed in to trade with other uh, people and negotiate. And this became the preeminent bottle in the whole world. In fact, the world's oldest message in a bottle was dropped off a German research vessel in 1886 and only discovered in Perth, Australia, in 2018. It's a very Australian story. There's a family going for a walk. They see a bottle. They open it. Uh, they dried out the paper that was inside with a hairdryer and then realized how old it was. And that bottle and the message is the traditional Dutch glass Geneva bottle. And you can actually see it at the Geneva Museum in Holland, uh, in Schiedam, near Rotterdam, where it's on display. So history up the wazoo. One brand that dominated was Udolfo Wolf Aromatic Schnapps. Udolfo Wolf Aromatic Schnapps was born of a businessman based in Germany, in Hamburg. And he bought the Geneva from the Blankenheim and Nolet distillery in Rotterdam. And he sold it all around the world. You're going to see a sales number in a moment that's going to blow your mind. But... When the company was still only 30 or 40 years old, it had a $1 million ad budget. It might have been the largest Geneva brand that the world has ever seen. They had sales offices in Melbourne, Buenos Aires. They promoted it as a health tonic to uh, cure you of the injurious effects of drinking water. And of course, because his name was Wolf, there was a wolf on the label. But Geneva was everywhere in modern culture back then. For instance, you've probably heard the story of Rip Van Winkle, which is a wildly popular short story written in America in 1819. And you probably might remember that he fell asleep and he thought it was for a few hours, but it turned out it had been for 20 years. Do you know why he fell asleep? You guessed it. He was a henpecked husband out for a walk with his dog in upstate New York. And he walked into a valley and suddenly there's all these, in his words, old time costumed people dressed like the Dutch settlers of the 1600s. And they were unloading barrels of Geneva, which they called Dutch gin or Holland gin. They were decanting it into big crocks and then they were sitting down and drinking it. So he had old Rip a couple of crocks of Geneva and then fell asleep for ooh, 20 years eighth president of America, Martin Van Buren, was and is to this day the only American president whose native language was not English. He was brought up in New York speaking Dutch in a Dutch household. English was his second language. And that's not even the oldest part of Geneva's history in the New World. The very first distillery ever built in America in either 1661, two or three was on Staten Island. And guess what? It was a Geneva distillery. Van Buren actually drank so much Geneva, which by then was being nicknamed Schiedams, that his nickname was Old Blue Nose. Here, if you happen to be watching the video, 
there's a Daguerro type. Daguerro types were forerunners of photographs. And this is one of the oldest ones in existence. It's actually from the Udolfo Wolf archive. And it shows, it's kind of a bling photo. You know the way you see like rap videos where they're showing off Lamborghinis and jewelries and diamonds and money. Yeah, there's two professional gamblers there sitting there. One of them's holding a load of money like fanned out another one's holding cards and oh wait a moment what's that on the bot on the table between them it's a bottle of geneva that looks just like a uh, old duff geneva bottle or one of those geneva bottles that was loaded into cases and rowed ashore hundreds and hundreds of years ago all around the world now by the 1850s just the harbor of new york just new york was importing 450 bottles of real Dutch Geneva for every one bottle of English gin that it imported. And as you can see by reading books such as Professor David Wondrich's Imbibe, the biography of celebrity bartender Jerry Thomas, Dutch and French and Belgian Geneva was the default until at least 1900. If you asked for gin, you didn't have to say Dutch gin or Holland gin. That was the default. If you wanted anything else, you had to say, oh, I want English gin or I want dry gin. And that didn't really kick in until about 1900. That first book, that first ever cocktail book from 1862 that Jerry Thomas wrote was deciphered by Professor Wondrich in recent times, only about 10 or 12 years ago, that every recipe that says gin is actually referring to 100% malt wine Geneva. At the Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago, Wolf's aromatic ski dam schnapps boasted that they had sold 45 million bottles by then. The company had been going for about 75 years by then, so that's not bad at all. So it boomed out of control, and the tiny little town of Schiedam near Rotterdam in Holland by the late 1800s was home to as many as 392 distilleries, plus the yeast factories, the shipping companies, the glass factories, and everything. There's a visual here of the Vrijheid, the Freedom Windmill, which is actually the oldest, tallest operating windmill in the world, right outside the Hermann Janssen distillery in Schiedam. It's still working, it mills the grain for Old Duff, and it dates to 1785. Now in 1902, all the Geneva distillers got together because they had seen the rise of the column still. Column stills let you make neutral alcohol. Geneva was always made on a pot still, just like whiskey. But the column still had been painted by an Irishman, Anus Coffee, in 1830. And although it didn't get popular in Holland until around 1880, the traditional Geneva distillers were a little bit wary of this. So in 1902, they set up a voluntary scheme called the Seal of Schiedam. You could only get the seed of Schiedam, a paper label that goes over the Geneva bottle, if there was no other kind of still even present in your distillery except a pot still. Your Geneva was grain-based. Uh, it was an accredited distillery. You had to pay for an inspector to come. And there was no sugar or additives or anything else added to it. However, they may have misjudged it a little bit in making it voluntary. So the pickup wasn't as much as they'd hoped. Now, Geneva was still rising. There's a brilliant picture of the general playboy, Bon Vivant, and cocktail and cookbook author, Charles H. Baker Jr. with his fat friend in 1935 in the Bahamas, Ernest Hemingway. He was, in many ways, Ernest Hemingway's even cooler mate was Charles H. Baker Jr. And Hemingway invented a Geneva cocktail called Death in the Gulf Stream, which he served to Baker on board Hemingway's boat when Hemingway was living in Cuba. And in fact, Hemingway wound up buying the house next to where Charles H. Baker Jr. settled in Florida and they hung out all the time. Famously, when Ray Charles, the world famous jazz musician, was traveling he had a writer for his dressing room this is mentioned in the movie ray 
where Jamie Foxx portrays him, that he needed to have a carafe of coffee and a bottle of, as he called it, Dutch gin, meaning Geneva. There's even a scene in the movie where Ray Charles' mistress tries to tempt him to come over to her and leave his family behind at Christmas. The advisor on the movie was Ray Charles' son, and one of the people in charge of the visual look of the movie was Ted Hay, who's also a incredibly vaunted cocktail historian. And he halted production down in New Orleans for two days so that they could ship in an authentic 1950s Geneva bottle to use in the scene. Geneva was and is very popular on the west coast of Africa in places like Benin, Togo, Nigeria, Ghana. There it's used in the libation ceremony for people who are members of tribes. Very similar to what happens with rum and other spirits in the Caribbean and South America, you pour a little Geneva out as a toast to the spirits before actually toasting with Geneva. And afterwards, they very often build shrines of Geneva bottles in the countryside using the familiar oblong bottle. So they know it's from Holland or Belgium, uh, but they feel that it is part of their culture now. So. What happened to Geneva? Well, the first thing, perhaps quite obvious, is 1914. Not only did this rob most European countries of a generation of its young men and often women, but it was conducted on places that produced and consumed Geneva, Holland, Belgium, Germany and France, as well as other places. Distilleries were closed down, taken over, stripped of their coffer to uh, make armaments, forced to convert to making explosives instead of drinking alcohol. So World War I, not good. Then, almost as soon as World War I was over, one of the largest markets in the world, Prohibition, went dry, right? America voted for Prohibition. Now, until then, people were real connoisseurs in America and the cocktail had been invented there and the bartenders were just about the best in the world. And well-made cocktails were very subtle and nuanced and they used things like bitters and tinctures and everybody prided themselves and known quite a bit about drinking. And all of a sudden, boom, every good bartender had to leave because you were immediately a criminal. Many of them left the profession. They got into insurance or other sales or real estate. Some of them went to work in soda fountains because instead of alcohol, they had all the products that a pharmacist could make for them, like flavorings and colorings. Some of them went to work on cruise liners because, of course, they could serve alcohol once they got outside the American three mile limit. And many of them emigrated to other countries like France and Germany and England and Cuba to start those countries' cocktail revolutions. What was left in America were rookies with nobody to train them uh, and people who were open to the idea of maybe getting arrested, so maybe not the best bartenders in the world. And it was very difficult to get hold of stuff. Most people were not drinking smuggled alcohol. Instead, they were drinking whatever they could get, which was illegally distilled alcohol that had been made as quickly as possible to avoid being detected. And the bartenders learned, instead of bringing out subtle hints of flavor with a dash of bitters or a spoon of a liqueur, that the best thing was just to drown it with a ton of juice or ginger ale or something like that. So that was kind of the birth of what some people call the frat house drinking culture, you know, where the best bartender is the one who makes the drink where, ooh, you can't taste the booze. In fact, cocktail historian and writer Robert Hess has said that prohibition was a collective lobotomy for American mixology. Now, what all this meant for Geneva was that suddenly they lost a major export market. And when it came back 14 years later, America didn't drink the way it had 14 years previously. People had gotten used to sweeter, lighter things. They'd gotten used to cocktails that concealed the base flavor. 
So in many ways, the Dutch, the Belgians and the French and the Germans retooled and they began getting into things like vodka and liqueurs. And they let Geneva become a product that sold in maybe some other markets and was pretty strong in the domestic market. But that was it. And the third thing, this isn't going to surprise you, World War Two. If World War One was bad, World War Two was way worse. Uh, Holland and Belgium in particular were absolutely devastated. And when it concluded, everybody wanted to get back to business. Bear in mind, there was still food rationing for years after the conclusion of World War Two in places like Holland and Belgium. So people had other things on their minds and they were just trying to survive. Part of that survival gave them a freedom to try new stuff. Now, there had always been a kind of Geneva called Young Geneva. And young in this context doesn't mean unaged because all Geneva was pretty much unaged back then. It meant new style. And here's how it came about. There are articles about this new style Geneva in Dutch colonies like Indonesia in the late 1800s, but it was definitely a bit of an oddity, as if they were trying it out. Because what Geneva is, is essentially unaged whiskey with a tiny bit of juniper and maybe some other botanicals. The juniper is not there to dominate, as is the case with gin. It's more like the dash of bitters that you add to make an old fashioned. That grain distillate, whether you make it from rye, corn, barley, wheat, or a combination of them, uh, when it goes through the pot still at least three times, it comes out and it's known as malt wine. It's not wine, there's no grapes in it. That's just a translation from the Dutch word, mouth wine. And originally all Geneva was 100% malt wine. Starting in the 1880s or so, Geneva distillers began adding some of this new neutral alcohol that you could make on these new column stills. Just as the column stills led to the creation of blended whiskey in Scotland. In the 1950s, the Balls Company began experimenting with less and less and less and less and less and less and less malt wine. They used a brand that they'd had since at least the 1920s called Clairein. And what they helped to invent was this new style Geneva, which doesn't have 100% malt wine in it, or 70 or 50 or 20. It might have as little as one and a half percent malt wine. The other 98 and a half percent being neutral alcohol. And because they felt empowered to experiment, they began saying, OK, well, do we need, even need to use this grain alcohol? We could use even cheaper molasses based or sugar beet based alcohol. And that is what they did. And it was a wild success. There's one brand of young New Style, Geneva, that to this day, this one brand, Hartebelt, outsells the entire vodka category in Holland. Because bear in mind, in the 1950s, nobody in Holland drank particularly very much vodka. And suddenly this thing came on the market, which was 98.5% neutral alcohol. And it was cheap. And you could mix it. And essentially what they did was preempt Vodka in Holland, and to this day, vodka doesn't sell as well as it does in other countries. Now, they had to give this new product a name because back then everything was called Geneva. So they began calling the existing Geneva Old Geneva, even though it typically wasn't aged, and they called this new style stuff Young Geneva. So Young Geneva is like the child that almost destroys its parent. In 1971, the Balls Company came up with another innovation, which is called Korenwein. Korenwein with a C is trademarked by Balls. Korenwein with a K is a term that anyone can use. And technically, according to the legislation, Korenwein doesn't have to be Geneva at all. What it is, is it has to contain at least 51% malt wine, which is the pot distillate. Uh, you can add up to 20 grams of sugar per liter. You don't have to age it. But if you do mention age on the label, it has to be at least one year in barrels of no more than 700 litres. But it doesn't mention juniper at all. However, if you do add a tiny bit of juniper, you're allowed to call it Korenwein Geneva. This is an important distinction to make. They promoted this as a premium. And 
everybody likes to have a gimmick, especially when you're inventing a new category. So they said, what you should do is drink it chilled. Drink your quarter vine chilled. And they promoted it at very upmarket parties, including the herring parties that mark the new herring coming in. These are very frequently high society parties in May and June in Holland and all the movers and shakers attend it and they auction off the first barrel of herring with the, the nice winter fat for a vast amount of money to charity and everybody drinks Cordovine. So in that sense, uh, they did succeed in creating a premium. And in the dark days between 1966 and 86, there was no 100% malt wine. Geneva would see the Sida made at all. And in 1986, something very cool happened. Before we find out what that was, let's look at something to give a bit of an idea. If you can see this graph, it tracks Geneva consumption from 2007 to 2018. It's a Spirits NL report from the Dutch Alcohol Authorities. And you see old Geneva declining every year, but young Geneva is declining too. What's happened is they're not recruiting new drinkers. And rather than try to turn it around, the industry seems to have said, oh, well, every time someone dies, we're going to lose a young Geneva drinker. And instead, what's happened is there has been a rise in a spirit that was never particularly consumed very much in Holland at all. Gin, English style gin. It's been absolutely booming for especially the last six years. And it's outpaced growth for everything else. So what happened? Well, Young Geneva was booming out of control from the 1950s right into the late 1970s and 80s. Now, remember I told you, my friends the Dutch are lovely people, but they're traders, commercial people. So instead of investing to build brands of Young Geneva and make emotional connections to people, instead of doing that, they just undercut one another on price. Because if you could sell it for 50 cents cheaper than your competitor, you would get more sales to compensate that. Unfortunately, your competitor could cut their price as well. So everyone has cut their prices down to the bone to the stage where you start looking at making cost cutting efficiencies in the supply chain. And the most expensive thing is to actually run a distillery day in and day out, especially if it's not busy all the time. So almost every distillery in Holland closed and they outsourced Geneva production hilariously in my opinion almost always to one single distillery in Belgium the lovely Filiers distillery which is in Dainza in Belgium they produce the Geneva for all the big companies that you've ever heard of from Holland for Balls for De Kuiper for Rosa for Hochhaus and so long as the Geneva is bottled in Holland they're allowed to put made in Holland on the label so now we've got the margins sliced all the way down to the bone they can't go any further things tick along for a while and in 1986 one of the last distillers left in holland the herman jansen distillery which is seven generations of jansen's distilling since 1777 decided to bring back 100 percent malt wine with the seal of schiedam which is the paper label you can see if you're looking at the visual here so they paid for an inspector they made sure their distillery was up to spec and they made an old school legit 100 percent malt wine geneva that earned the first seal of schiedam in 30 years it's still being produced today and it's called notaris in 1998 the former melkers distillery on the long haven in schiedam had been converted into the Geneva Museum. And by the way, if you're ever in Schiedam, uh, it is an incredible visit and it's also the home of the Geneva Festival every single year. They decided, because it's still got all the distilling equipment, that they would make 100% malt wine Geneva with the Seed of Schiedam as well. And they became the second brand since 1986 to gain the seal of Schiedam. And then in 2017, I created Old Tough Geneva with the uh, help of the people from the Hermann Janssen Distillery who distill it there to my specifications. And that became the third brand in existence 
of 100% malt wine Geneva with the seal of Schiedam. Now there are other 100% malt wine Genevers. You can make 100% malt wine Geneva in Hamburg. You can make it near Lille in France. You can make it in Belgium. But these are the only three in the world that carry the seal of Schiedam. What we've seen lately is a bit of a rebirth, a very welcome one. So around 2009, you saw a big mover balls coming out with what they call balls 1820, which is a Geneva that they pushed in all the export markets. Other people followed. Old Duff launched in 2017, as you know. In between then, Under the Bonepies distillery was uh, set up. It's a distillery with a very long history. But the intellectual property was bought by a businessman. He got a building in Schiedam where it had once started out many hundreds of years ago. And they're making 100% malt wine Geneva. There's other brands either making their own Geneva or they're getting it made at another distillery. Uh, they're doing it with flavoured Geneva. They're doing it with young style Geneva. They're doing it with old style Geneva. Some of them are focusing on an export market, some are focusing on domestic. The fact that people are doing it is a very good thing. In fact, the five largest producers, four from Holland and one from Belgium, got together and they managed to unlock a few million euros from the European community to promote the whole Geneva category in the USA. So they give category-wide trainings, they attend trade shows, they do tastings, they organize press trips for journalists from America, and it's all under a much bigger banner promoting European-made products called Enjoy It's From Europe. What I think is particularly good is that in the last year or two, the Martinez, the signature Geneva cocktail, if you ask me, has been featured in Simon Difford's prestigious World Top 100 Cocktails which come about based on how many searches there have been in the course of the year for him. So if enough people are searching to get the Martinez in at number 72, that's a pretty healthy sign. The Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, a decade long in the making by aforementioned Professor David Wondrich and Noah Rothbaum, came out just last year. And to give you some idea of it, there are Articles written in it on Geneva, written on Kohlerwein, written on Kasper Janzon Kohlhaas. I know this because I wrote them. But in a nice little twist, the only bottle on the cover is a Geneva bottle, which is actually the Kitterland's Geneva brand from Blankenheim and Nolet Distillery in Rotterdam. It's a very old bottle. And the only cocktail on the cover is a Holland razor blade cocktail, which was invented one day by our old friend, celebrity playboy charles h baker jr when he was getting drunk with klm pilots in uh, in jakarta in indonesia so these are green shoots of recovery we shouldn't be complacent just yet but geneva's in a better place than it's been for a long time so let's talk mixology here old style geneva is a masterful grain distillate much much closer to whiskey than anything else. So whiskey cocktails are usually the best way to go, right? Think about old fashions and sours and the Martinez, which is also the predecessor of the Manhattan. Now, just to make things complicated, gin cocktails do sometimes work, right? The Negroni and Boulevardier, Boulevardier was originally a rye whiskey cocktail, work really well. The Bramble cocktail works really well, but sometimes they don't. One of the worst things you can do is mix gin with uh, dry vermouth to make something approximating a martini. It does not work. And by the way, Geneva and tonic tastes like shit as well. So like anything else, if you were making a whiskey cocktail, you'd look at the mash bill and you might look at any aging that's gone on. So how much malt wine is inside and what the mash bill is, is going to be one of your best guides. So 100% malt wine Geneva with a lot of rye is going to taste like rye whiskey. 70% uh, malt wine Geneva with a lot of wheat is going to be more like a wheated bourbon. It also, with the more and more, the higher the malt wine content, it's going to work really well with things like dairy, horchata and stuff. Uh, High malt wine content Geneva Alexander cocktail is a thing of beauty. 
And Young and Geneva is essentially vodka. Like it's typically got 3% or less malt wine. So you can mix it with vodka. And there is a fleeting edge of flavor there to play with. It's not nothing. It's just not the power heavyweight of 100% malt wine or high malt wine content. All right, let's talk mixology. This is the Phil Collins. Uh, you can only call it a Phil Collins if you make it with my Geneva. Old Dove Geneva. For everyone else, it's a Collins. And it's a lovely story. Uh, in the 1820s, there was a hotshot theatre manager who owned and managed a theatre in New York called Stephen Price. And he was asked to come to London to manage a theatre. And then he was at, later asked to manage a members club associated with some of it and that meant he was exotic and popular and he mingled with the highest levels of society kings and queens and princes and princesses but he also mingled with the actors who were popular celebrities and almost universally liked to drink and what Stephen Price drank back in New York was what they called gin punch now the English had kind of invented punch for the long journeys to India because the beer went bad and they also wanted to get citrus into their sailors diet so that they wouldn't get scurvy and die which was inconvenient so they mixed up the five ingredients of punch sweet sour strong all that kind of thing and it was the mark of a gentleman that he would make a large bowl of punch and nobody who could be better at making punch than so and so charles dickens prided himself on it and you'd stand around drinking at the punch bowl and discussing all the things of the day and each glass of punch was about 14 percent alcohol yeah americans didn't give a shit about that they were far too busy building a new country they wanted to get something short and strong and sharp and neck, neck it down and, and go out and and capture the rest of the country so the Americans reduced the punch to a single serve. They added two ingredients that were new or common in England, in America, I mean. They added ice. Around the same time, Frederick Tudor, a American businessman, worked out a way and built a distribution network for ice. So everybody in the major cities could inexpensively get hold of high quality ice. And of course, this appealed in drinks as well. So the gin punch that Stephen Price was drinking was 100% malt wine Geneva, lemon juice, sugar, and ice in a single serve with, because he was fancy, a squirt of soda water or any kind of fizzy water. Now, he brought this drink over to London. Everybody began drinking it in London. And it became such a hot drink that the head waiter at a gentleman's club called Limmer's which is in Mayfair, close to the present-day Connaught Hotel. His name was Mr. Colin, and he became famous for serving it because this members club, well, how can I say it? It was a bit lively. The members would shoot at the clock. They'd set fire to the carpet. The doorman had one leg. It was that kind of a place. It wasn't exactly Soho House. And Mr. Colin became so famous for serving it, it became known as Mr. Colin's Punch. And later, of course, that was shortened to Collins. And not much later after that, the English switched to using English gin instead of Dutch Geneva. This is a fantastic drink. It is the conversion drink for Geneva. Uh, I think you should use Cordovine Geneva, which, as you remember, has 51% malt wine content or more. It's really nice with 100% malt wine, too. Uh, I like using a rich sugar syrup, so you get more sweetness for less dilution. And this will get somebody drinking Geneva because it's delicious because of the Geneva you're really not hiding the flavor much at all that said let's move on to a bit of a powerhouse the improved gin cocktail meaning of course the improved Holland gin cocktail meaning the improved Geneva cocktail now by the second edition of Jerry Thomas's bartender's guide this had come out and it's the fancy version of the gin cocktail with a little uh, lemon zest moistening glass. And David Wondrich has described this as New York's answer to the Sazerac. Because this is a deeply delicious drink. But like any drink, like a Sazerac, like an old fashioned, it is all about precision and tiny nuances. So here you are going to want two ounces of 100% malt wine Geneva, a bar spoon. So five milliliters or a teaspoon of 
either a dry curacao or a maraschino liqueur so for curacao i like pierre ferrand dry curacao i like cointreau uh if you want to use grand marnier fill your boots but i would only use half a bar spoon or two and a half mls in that case uh maraschino liqueur really hard to beat luxardo universally available delicious stuff uh the stock brand is pretty good too to that you're going to add five milliliters of rich simple syrup which is two to one simple syrup three dashes of aromatic bitters now back then there was a lot of brands battling for the aromatic bitters thrown angostura was a major one stoutons was a major one bokers um once misprinted as bogarts was a major one and what i like to do if i'm being fancy is do one dash of the bitter truth bokers bogarts bitters one dash of angostura aromatic and one dash of Peychaud's bitters don't knock it till you've tried it you then need a dash of absinthe which it's really hard to do so i like to actually spritz absinthe from a spray bottle or even just spritz it into the glass or even just pour a little in the glass roll it around the inside pour it out again before you strain in the cocktail so you stir that stir it straight up don't forget the lemon zest the lemon zest will bring it to life all right moving along we get to the the big parents of geneva mixology which is the martinez so this first popped up in print in chicago and cleveland as martinez or manhattan made with whiskey or gin now if you read that now that sounds ridiculous how how, how could it be a cocktail that you make with interchangeably whiskey or gin but of course we know that back then they were talking about 100 percent malt wine geneva and that is whiskey to all intents and purposes so what you're going to want is two ounces 60 milliliters of sweet vermouth you're going to want something with backbone a bit of spice so any vermouth to torino is going to tick the box there you're going to need an ounce 30 milliliters of 100 percent malt wine geneva except no substitutes you're going to want a bar spoon of maraschino liqueur again we're liking 5 ml of luxardo and then three dashes of aromatic bitters which i wouldn't switch up here i'd go angostura aromatic all the way stir it with ice strain it straight up and then take my advice taste it then zest a lemon over it and taste it again the lemon electrifies this drink serve it with three of those nice speared gourmet cherries from uh either luxardo or fabry or somebody like that so the reason i like this switched around recipe where there's twice as much vermouth as geneva is the first recipes for the martinez or the manhattan they were either 50 50 vermouth and geneva or they had a little bit more vermouth than geneva and this particular ratio which was picked from the history books by the famous bar dante here in new york city works really well and it results in a drink that's it's not non-alcoholic but it's less alcoholic than a rye whiskey manhattan and you can have two instead of one or maybe uh you could even have three of these instead of two of the other incidentally less than a year after appearing in print as martinez or manhattan whiskey or gin it seemed to have become generally agreed that you made martinez's with geneva and you made manhattan's with whiskey and with one or two diversions such as the turf club cocktail that's kind of how it went ever since incidentally you may have heard of the link between these cocktails and the martini well around 1900 extra dry vermouth was introduced to the usa for the very first time and it was a huge hit huge so much so it actually hurt geneva sales because geneva like whiskey doesn't really mix very well with dry vermouth certainly not in martinez proportions so the bartenders who refer to it as dutch gin or holland gin they're like well wait a second there's another new product here and it's called english dry gin what if we mix this dry vermouth with the dry gin and they did that and they invented the martini so the martinez and the manhattan are the proud parents of the martini and that just goes to show just how much involved in the history of mixology geneva has been 
Now, a bit of contemporary mixology, because the thing is, the past should be an inspiration, but not a straitjacket. This was a cocktail created by the legendary Beach Bum Berry himself, owner of Latitude 29 in New Orleans, uh, author of more historical tiki and mixology books than you can shake a stick at. And the Suriname Swizzle is a deceptively simple drink. You want to have one and three quarter ounces of something like Old Duff Geneva 40% ABV, which qualifies as a Coravine. It's got 53% malt wine in it. If you can't get hold of it, get a Coravine, preferably one with no sugar added, which isn't easy. An ounce, 30 mLs of fresh lime juice, and you're going to need Jeff Berry's coconut syrup. Don't worry, I'll give you the recipe now. One dash of aromatic bitters. And I think the way that Jeff recommended it is you fill something like a julep cup or a swizzle mug with crushed ice, pour in the ingredients, swizzle until icy cold, and then you hand mold an ice ball over the top and you zest the lime on top of it. So... How to make uh, Beach Bum's Coconut Syrup, of which you'll need 30 mLs. Reduce two cups of coconut water to one cup under heat. Add one cup of cane sugar and stir to dissolve. Moving brightly along, this was a best seller the entire time it was on the menu at the Nomad Hotel Bar in New York, which is sadly no more. It was created by Nathan O'Neill who you can now see at Claridge's in London. And it's sort of an exploration of funk. So the cocktail is called the Kingsman. And it's one ounce, 30 mLs of 100% malt wine Geneva, like Old Duff, half an ounce, 15 mLs of rye whiskey, originally Nathan used Woodford Reserve, half an ounce, that is 15 mL, of a blank agricole rum, most of them will do well. Nissan is really, really good. Half an ounce, 15 mLs of Oloroso Sherry. A bar spoon, 5 mLs of banana liqueur, because Nathan is playful. And half an ounce of brown butter fat-washed falernum. So you stir this down with ice and you serve it over an oversized ice cube, right? It's old-fashioned style. And what this is... All the funky flavors, so unaged Geneva, aged rye, uh, unaged agricole, are kind of brought together by the sweetness of the sherry and the banana liqueur and that little bit of falernum, which you might remember is actually a syrup. So here's the recipe if you can't see the visuals. To make brown butter fat wash falernum, you toast 100 grams of unsalted butter in a pan until it's light brown. You stir that up with 700 milliliters of falernum syrup, put it in a plastic bottle, seal it, and put it in the freezer for 24 hours. You then strain the liquid off through a fine filter, right? You'll be leaving all the fat behind. You'll fat wash the liquid with all of that. And another one, speaking of the Connaught in London, comes from my old friend, Agil Perone. This cocktail is called the Gate Number no. One because they have a large metal gate on the left of the bar in the Connaught in London. And that's where they keep all their precious stuff, like Geneva. And this is sort of like a wall of sound cocktail. There's lots of elements contributing. So you get this incredibly unified and integrated flavor. So the gate number one is 20 milliliters of Old Duff Geneva, 40%, or any other Coravine style Geneva, 20 milliliters of gin, five milliliters of a peated Scottish single malt, 15 milliliters of sweet vermouth, 20 milliliters of Pinot Noir wine, 20 milliliters of tawny port, 10 milliliters of milk jam, dulce de leche, if you know, and then 30 milliliters of a strawberry Tulsi, Tulsi means basil, kombucha. So 30 milliliters of strawberry basil kombucha. Stir with ice, strain straight up. And if you happen to have the patisserie department of the Connaught Hotel at your disposal, garnish with a chocolate gate or grid. Uh, I guess if you don't have that, you can just drink it. It's an absolutely amazing cocktail. Moving from London to Hong Kong, this cocktail was created by Arlene Wong when she was at the Pontiac in Hong Kong and was a brand ambassador for Mr. Black, which is a coffee liqueur from Australia and a very, very good one. So it's a twist 
on the espresso martini that goes really deep on the coffee flavor and doesn't require pulling a shot of espresso or having your bar set up with coffee. So it's a coffee-less espresso martini, which is extremely delicious and very fast to make. So uh, the Moonless Sky is half an ounce, 15 milliliters of uh, Old Duff Geneva, 40%, or any Cora vine or old wine, or old style Geneva you have to hand. An ounce and a half, 45 mLs of Mr. Black coffee liqueur. Half an ounce, 15 mLs of a Bianco or Blanc vermouth. And a bar spoon that is five mLs of rich simple syrup, which is two to one. You shake it as if your life depends on it, strain it straight up, and like every good espresso martini, garnish it with three coffee beans. Getting close to the end now, this is the newest drink of the slideshow. It is, of course, called a Dill Collins from the inventive mind of Brian Evans, beverage director for, among other places, Rule of Thirds in Brooklyn in New York. And this is another wall of flavors drink that is wonderfully presented. So it's an ounce, 30 mLs of Old Duff Geneva 40% ABV, half an ounce, 15 mLs of Swedish Aquavit, a bar spoon, 5 mLs of melon liqueur, half an ounce, 15 mLs of honeydew melon syrup, half an ounce of celery juice, and half an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. So you shake it with ice, you strain it into a Collins glass that's full of ice and has a little fizzy water in it, about three ounces of water in it. And then as the pièce de résistance, you float an ounce of a two to one lemongrass shochu plum liqueur mix. So you mix lemongrass shochu and plum liqueur, Japanese umeshu together in the ratio of two parts lemongrass, one part plum liqueur. And you float one ounce of that on top. You get this brilliant uh, purple color and you garnish it with a uh, dill and a melon ball. So this is an unreal drink that releases flavor aspects of Geneva that might just get past you if you're using it only in classics. And finally, the Hoppy Bob, a beer cocktail from a country that's known for Geneva and beer, Holland. This is from Bob van den Brie, who owns Wigbolt, a Geneva cocktail bar in Haarlem, just outside Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So it's 60 mLs, two ounces of 100% malt wine Geneva. It's 20 mLs, which is two thirds of an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And it's 20 mLs, another two thirds of an ounce of an IPA syrup. I'll give you the recipe in a moment. Plus a bar spoon, five mLs of Campari. Give it a good hard shake with ice, fine strain it into a pre-chill cocktail coupe and garnish it, and I promise you this isn't just a gimmick, with a cube of aged Dutch cheese. And to make the IPA syrup, just combine about 330 mLs of an IPA beer, anyone you like, 500 grams of regular white sugar, and about six grams of food grade citric acid. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for bearing with me. If you have any questions, about this or Geneva in general. If you'd like to learn more, if you'd like a signed photograph of me, please hit me up on social media. I'm on Instagram, Philip S. Duff. That's P H I L I P S D U F F. I occasionally look at on Instagram, Old Duff Geneva. That's O L D D U F F G E N E V E R. You can also find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, everywhere really except TikTok, because obviously fuck TikTok. And if you're talking about Geneva, if you're online, if you want to look for stuff, check out the hashtags Geneva, that's hashtag G E N E V E R, and hashtag Real Dutch Geneva, that's R E A L D U T C H. G-E-N-E-V-E-R. And wherever you are, if you haven't already been doing it, I hope you're drinking good Geneva. Cheers. <laughs>